I got a, I got a video pulled up on my uh, computer in my office that YouTube recommended it to me, and I'm kind of glad they did. The title uh, of the video is, What About the Errors in the Bible? What errors? So I started playing it. I haven't got too far in it. There's a guy up on stage. He's probably some sort of Bible scholar. And um, it looks like a, a, a student gathering. And I think it was down in Texas or, da or Fort Worth or Dallas, somewhere around. And I can't remember exactly where it was. But the name of the college was like UMC. I imagine the M probably stood for Methodist. I don't know. But anyway, a, a young college lady stood up and asked a question of the speaker on stage. What about all the errors that are in the New Testament? And so I kind of figured where this guy was going to go. And I listened to just enough to where I was right. Because as soon as he started talking, he said, well, there are errors in the New Testament. And the reason uh, how, how we're able to deal with that is done by comparing the various manuscripts. And that's as far as he got, because I figured that's what he was going to say. Because that's really where the fight is. And it is a battle. We're in a battle for our faith. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And uh, I was taught from two different Bible colleges that all the Bibles are mistake laden they have errors especially in the new testament and so i already know where this guy's going to go he's going to say that we have better older manuscripts and when we compare them with the manuscripts that had been used for years then we find out that the manuscripts the greek manuscripts that had been used for years um, are full of mistakes because we trust these two manuscripts that date back to 300 A.D. One of those manuscripts came from a monastery at the alleged Mount Sinai. There's a in this what's called the Sinai Peninsula. It's in between the two fingers of the Red Sea. Um, somebody, Catherine the Great or somebody said, that looks like Mount Sinai. So they named it Mount Sinai. But the Bible says Mount Sinai is not in Egypt. It's in Arabia. And it is. It's in Saudi Arabia. But anyway, uh, the Sinaiticus manuscript was found uh, in a pile of manuscripts that were marked for destruction back in the 1800s. And a scholar by the name of Tischendorf was at this monastery looking for old Manuscripts, and he supposedly found uh, this manuscript of the New Testament. And he looked at it and he said, I bet this is part of the manuscript documents that came out in 300 AD. So they took his word at it. And then there is the, the Vaticanus, which is in the Vatican Library. And they don't let anybody see it. They've made copies of the New Testament portion of it, but there's portions of the Vaticanus document that common eyes have not seen and probably will not for whatever reason. We don't know. But anyway, when you compare the, the, Vatic, the Vatican Greek manuscript of the New Testament with the Mount Sinai Greek Testament, they don't match. In, in between themselves, they don't agree. Over 6,000 times in just... The four Gospels, they don't agree with each other as to the reading of the verses. And so modern scholarship has elected to accept those two manuscripts as the authority uh, over the 5,000 other manuscripts that differ from these two. And so that's why men like that can say... There's errors all in the New Testament. We know why there's errors. And it's because the manuscripts were faulty. And we can compare them with better, what they call better manuscripts. And I don't believe that. I was trying to go to sleep last night. 
And for some reason, I was, I run arguments through my head. And I try to think how people would ask questions like that. What about errors in the Bible? And how I might answer those questions. When you read the Bible and just the Bible, you will never, ever find any verse, any portion of text, any chapter, any story, anything in the scripture that will lead you to believe that the Bible would become faulty. In other words, it would, be, it would eventually have errors, mistakes, uh, missing words, words that were added, words that were taken out. The Bible itself, what it says of itself, doesn't tell you that. The Bible says of itself in numerous places, like Psalm 12, the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. So if I just take that one verse and I apply it, to what I'm going to believe about the Bible. That verse, or that, those two verses, tw verse uh, 6 and 7 from Psalm 12, tells me that number one, the Bible is pure, and number two, that God promised that He would preserve every word of it forever. So what am I supposed to believe? I have a guy up on the stage, a scholar, a professor, who's telling me, yes, the Bible is full of mistakes. The New Testament has errors in it. I look at that, but then I look at uh, 2 Peter uh, chapter 1, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. That verse tells me that the word of God is incorruptible, meaning that not only has it not been corrupted, it's not capable of being corrupted. We, we just learned here a while back that while Jesus was laying in the tomb, uh, from the time they crucified him to the time he rose again, his body did not corrupt at all. There was no corruption. God did not allow his Holy One to see corruption. And Jesus always identifies himself, and the Bible identifies Jesus with the Word of God. Uh, Revelation 19, and he had a name written, which is the Word of God. Uh, John said it, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So, w was it talking about Christ? Yes. Was it talking about the written Word of God? Absolutely. Because in John, turn to John 17. Here I am telling you all these verses, you could turn to them and learn this yourself. God gave me a phrase last night that I just kept bouncing. I didn't get to sleep till probably 3.30 last night, this morning. In, uh, what did I tell you? John 17. Well, that's good, because I turned to John 7. Um, uh, let's see here. They have kept, verse 6, they have kept thy word. Um... Verse 8, for I've given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them and have known surely that I came. So God gave Jesus the words. Jesus gave the words to the apostles. Did the apostles corrupt them? Did the apostles take things out and add things to it? Not on your life. No way, no how. Um, he uses the phrase in verse 11, Holy Father. Uh, let's see here. Verse 14, I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Um, verse 17, here it is. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Now, when it says thy word, was Jesus referring to himself? But was he also referring to something else? Thy word is truth. What does that tell you? The Bible is truth. 
And the word is present tense. Right now. The, thy word is truth. And so there is not one verse anywhere. And if, the, if there was, I guarantee you these scholars would be all over it. But there is not one place in your Bible where you will ever read that there will be errors, there will be mistakes, God's word will fall into corruption. Um, nothing like that. There is a warning at the end of the Bible that tells those who have taken words out of the Bible, there's a warning to them that if they do that, God will take their name out of the book of life. There is another warning in there that if they add words to the word of God, like the Catholic Church, the Mormons, they do it. They add the Book of Mormon, Pearl of Great Price, all those things, Doctrine and Covenants. They add all that to the word of God. Uh, and the Mormons use King James. Okay, But they add to it and thus that's the, the, the Book of Mormon overrides the, the King James Bible in their eyes. Uh, but anyway, uh, the warning is when you add to God's word, God will add unto you the plagues that are written in this book. So there's a warning to anyone, anyone who would dare alter the text or the words that are in this book. Um, those are fighting words with me. Okay, it would be like you coming up to me with a title to a car that turns out to be my car. Okay, and you rewrote the title and you give it to me and say, give me your old title. We're going to replace it with this new title. Why? Well, that old title is old. This is new. Well, I don't need a new title. I got the title that I want. I got the title that I bought with the car. Huh? Yeah, the original. There's nothing wrong with the title that I have. It says that the car is mine. It's in my name, registered in my name, licensed in my name. I, I'm the guy that puts gas in it. It's my foot on the brake pedal. So why give me a new title? Well, it just updates the language. No, I'm fine. I really am. I'm fine with the language. It's over 400 years old, but it still works. Amen? Now, I don't have a car that's 400 years old. It still works. Okay? But I got a Bible that's over 400 years old, and it still works. It still saves men's souls, saved mine. So this is the contract. This is the words of the contract that God gave to me when I was nine years old. And I made a, an agreement with God that I would confess my sins, He would be faithful and just, and He would forgive me of my sins and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Now I like that verse the way it's written. Don't rewrite it. And tell me that you're making it better because there's nothing wrong with it as it is. Amen? Um... So, the phrase that, that was bouncing around in my head last night was absolute truth. I want to just ask you a question this morning. You don't have to raise your hand. It's a yes or no question. Do you believe in absolute truth? And what I mean by that is, is that there is something in this world that is 100% true. It is the only thing that is true in everything that it is and everything that it represents. It is final truth in that once you have this truth, there is nothing else to have. There's nobody else's truth. In other words, you guys accepted Christ as your savior. You're not now going out and visiting Buddhist camps, going to Mormon churches, going to Catholic church, going to Jewish temples 
and trying to learn other religions to see if theirs might be better than your religion. I'm here to tell you, I found what I was looking for. I don't need anything else and I'm not looking for anything else. Amen. Kind of like the wife. I got a wife. She's good to me. She takes very good care of me. She tells me things I want to hear and tells me things I don't want to hear. But she's good to me. I'm not trading her in for nobody else. I got a wife. Amen. Amen. And I've got a Bible. The Bible that was given to me when I was a boy. This same Bible is what I have in my hand right now. Not the same exact book. But the words are the exact same as they were when I was nine years old. Nobody's changed them. Nobody's altered them. And I'm fine with that. So if you ask me the question, do I believe in absolute truth? The answer is yes. Now, the Bible scholar who's on that video in there, and I'm going to watch the rest of it later on. The Bible scholar that's on that video, if I were to ask him, does he believe in absolute truth? I already know that, number one, he either is going to lie to save face. Or he's going to know that I'm leading him to a conclusion that he does not want to agree to. Which is, if you believe in absolute truth, why then would you say that the Bible has mistakes in it? Because if it has errors in it, it cannot be absolute truth. Somebody sent us a gold piece in the mail. It's in the safe. And it's 99.99999 whatever, pure gold. Okay, so what's gold worth now? Yeah, a couple thousand. Okay. Um, we watched the old Price of Right shows from the 80s. And they would have little bars of one ounce of gold. And I think back in the 80s, gold was going for about three or four hundred dollars an ounce, five hundred maybe, something like that. I mean, gold is a good investment still, amen? It always goes up. But that, that gold piece, you cannot get it any finer than that, okay? I don't think it's possible to have 100% pure gold. I don't, know, I don't know how that works, but I already know that my Bible is that added number on there that makes it 100% pure words. The words of the Lord are pure words. So that tells me, and Jesus said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is what? Truth. So that scholar will either say, no, I do not believe in absolute truth because he doesn't believe the Bible is absolute truth. He doesn't believe that. He may say he believes it, but he doesn't because he believes that verses throughout the New Testament are either translated incorrectly or the manuscripts have variances between them. And so scholars really don't know what that verse might end up saying. Like I've told you, they've changed the NIV five times since 1973. Five times. You, there are verses that you probably, if you memorize verses from the NIV back in 1980, those verses may or may not be in the same NIV Bible that's out now. Because they've changed, in some places, they altered it to vary way far from the King James. And then years later, brought it back to closer to the reading of the King James. And what's up with that? If it was wrong 30 years ago, how come it's not still wrong now? Amen? If I tell a lie today, 30 years from now, if I go back and say, that really wasn't a lie, what am I doing? I'm either lying now or I lied then, but I'm lying. You can't change what's out there and say, well, it's an error today, but maybe in 30 years, it'll be true. We'll bring it back to the truth again. You can't do that. Then you don't have absolute, total, 100% truth. You don't have that. And God's standard is a high standard. Turn to Deuteronomy 18. You know, I didn't plan on this, 
But that video came up, and it kind of got me fired up a little bit. I, I'm, I feel a little like spitfire over there. I am going to run that into the ground, sister. Yeah, buddy. Now, I want you to look at verse 18. This is God speaking. God said, I will raise him up a prophet, capital P. Now, who is that? Jesus. And who is Jesus? The Word. He is the Word of God. He said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy Word is truth. Jesus, did, can you imagine Jesus telling a lie? If Jesus told one lie, I'm leaving. I'm leaving. If he told one lie, I'm out of here. And I'll tell you why. Yeah, I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, meaning he's going to be Jewish, like unto thee. And I will put my words in his mouth. We just read that, but that's what Jesus said. He said to his father, you gave me the words. Now I've given the words to my disciples. And I will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. Hebrews 10 tells us that when Jesus came into this world, he said, Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. So if the book of God contained the will of God and Jesus came to perform all that was in that book, could that book be wrong? And the answer is no. It has to be absolute truth. And speak unto them, uh, verse 19, It shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. This is a serious issue, and it's an issue that you better get right. So he said, But the prophet, in verse 20, which shall presume to speak a word in my name. And what did um, Peter and Jude say about the false teachers? Presumptuous are they. Self-willed. In other words, they presume to say things about God and say things that God told them to say, but God didn't say them. And the reason why I know God didn't say them is, is that it's not in this book. And if it's not in this book, it's not of God. So the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods... Even that prophet shall die. And now God is going to help his people. Because just, just like today, back then, uh, Peter said it, there were false prophets among them, even as there are false teachers now. And there are false teachers all around us. The internet's full of them. Every town in America has got false doctrines in it from some church or another. And they're everywhere. And how can you discern what's true? How can you discern that? How can you even know what's true and what's not? You take somebody's word for it? I wouldn't. I wouldn't. That title that that guy's trying to get me, should I just sign that without reading it? No. And if I read it, I don't find that it satisfies what I believe about my car, I'm not signing that. I'm not agreeing to that, and I'm not going to go along with it. Now, I made the mistake for several years in my life of switching sides on this issue. It started when I was in Bible college. It extended through until I became pastor here in about a year and a half or something like that, two years after I became pastor here, after God had beat the fire out of me, God very gently taught me that there's one Bible that's right. And it's this one. And I have not yet found an error. I've not found one. I believe it's true, every bit of it. So he says, if I say in thine heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord has spoken or which the Lord hath not spoken? How can we know we got a false prophet? How can we know we got a false word? Because he, he says the word here. 
How shall we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? The word. What is the word? The Bible. Verse 22. God has, a, has the highest standard that there can be. There cannot, and, and when God accepts us into heaven, can there be any sin in our life? No. God cannot accept us with even one sin. Because God always has a high standard. If you're going to go to heaven, all of your sins must be remitted. All of them forgiven. All of them washed clean and made whole. Amen? You can't fool God and hide your sin from Him and Him accidentally let you into heaven. It's not going to happen. Which is why even good people go to hell. They might have been good people, but they weren't perfect. And there's only one that's perfect and if we are in Christ, who is perfect, we will not receive that condemnation. But if we're not in Christ, we're on our own. Even just one sin. Condemnation. I think I have a verse that alludes to that in my sermon this morning. I think, maybe, I don't know. When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken. But the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously, thou shalt not be afraid of him. So, how many mistakes can the prophet make before he's wrong? Just one. If he's a false prophet, all he has to do is be wrong one time. That's a pretty high standard. Don't ask me. To not be wrong ever. And don't ask my wife on all the things I'm wrong at. Yes. Yeah. Yep. The dross. Yeah. Amen. That's what he said. God said, I will, to Israel, he said, I will refine thee as silver. Well, how does he refine silver? He purifies it seven times. Okay? Seven's God's number for perfection. So, according to God, the standard is one. One mistake. One error. So, this is... When, when Peter told us that he heard God's voice say about Jesus, this is my beloved son. Peter said, I heard it. John heard it. James heard it. We were all together on the mount where Jesus was transfigured. We heard God's voice say, this is my beloved son. But he follows up right after that by saying, but we have a more sure word of prophecy. In other words... I'm saying to you that God, I heard God say, this is my beloved son. But I'm wrong on some things, so we have something that's better than men. It's called his word. His word is absolute truth. Which means that there's, there cannot be one error in it. It cannot be wrong. It cannot be deceitful. Um, it has to be 100% pure. So the scholar will say, I do not believe in absolute truth because he knows where I would be going with a question like that. And I'm going to try to trap him in it. That's what I, that's what I rent through in my mind. So he probably won't say, I don't believe in absolute truth. He'll probably try to get around that question. Or he'll lie. Because he's got everybody watching him, listening to him. And he'll say, oh, I do believe in absolute truth. 
Then he'll say, because I know how they talk, because I talked this way for years. And I heard them say these things and I agreed with what they said during those years. They will say, well, God's word is pure in the original manuscripts. Now, what's the problem with that, Brother George? How many original manuscripts are there? There are no originals of any portion of the Bible anywhere. That's a, that's a good point. He says, if you find one mistake in there, how can you believe the rest of it? Lie, lie to me once, shame on you. Lie to me twice, shame on me. Exactly. We the people. How many of the people? All the people. There's a bill. Uh, one of our followers sent it to me. This is kind of off the subject a little bit. But it basically it applies to the Constitution, Bill of Rights, and uh, our rights. And it's a, it's a bill, and I forgot the wording of it, but it's, it's titled Bill uh, for the Prevention of Non-Government Authorized Paramilitary Groups. Now, I know a guy that... He told me, he said, he said, I belong to a group of guys. We stay in contact with one another. And he said, we're all loaded for bear. And he said, if the storm comes down, we're going to show up. Okay. Well, there are parts of the government that don't want that. And why wouldn't they want it? They want power. They want all the power. They don't want to share the power with the people. And I've got something to show you about that this morning. They want all the power. And so this bill is not like a retroactive bill. It doesn't wait for people to form a group and buy the guns and whatever they think they need. It's a bill designed to prevent them from forming in the first place. What does that tell you? Give us the guns now, and we'll prevent a non-government authorized paramilitary group from forming. That bill is in the House Judiciary Committee right now. Now, it may never make it out of committee. Most bills do not make it out of committee. But the mere fact that somebody who swore on the Constitution in Congress ever wrote a bill like this. Yeah, they lied when they swore the oath, did they not? So do they believe in absolute truth? No. They believe the Constitution is a bendy, twisty, Plato thing that you can make whatever you want to out of it. And so do a lot of preachers think that about the Bible. I do not change the Bible. I let the Bible change me. I, so this scholar, he's either going to say, I don't believe in absolute, or I do believe in absolute truth in the original manuscripts, but those original manuscripts are gone. They're not, they do not exist. So you believe in something that doesn't exist. You might as well say it's Santa Claus, because that doesn't exist. Um, I, I don't know what else. I, didn't, I fell asleep while running this through my mind, so I, I don't have it all worked out. I don't know if I'll ever be in a situation where I will physically ask somebody, do you believe in absolute truth other than today? But I'm asking you the question this morning, do you believe in absolute truth? Okay? You have to. You have to. You can't believe that God would ever let corruption steal His word. You can't. I did it. And it didn't turn out too good. I'm thankful that God brought me back. Father, I love your word. I'll stand up for it. 
I will read it, I'll preach it, I'll pray over it, I'll try to memorize it, I'll try to put it in my heart that I might not sin against thee. I'll fight for it, I'll die for it. I'll give my life for the country that matters the most to me, and that is heaven. And I'll give my life to the freedoms and the liberty that you have given me through the contract, the covenant of your word. And Father, I believe all of it. I may not understand some of it, but I believe it. And I pray, dear God, that for anybody who may be struggling with this issue, struggling with this idea, God, that you would work in them what you worked in me. And it was just that soft way of leading my thoughts down a road that brought me to the conclusion that my Bible has to be right, especially now in the world that we live in. Because, Father, we have, when something goes on in this world, we have no other place to go to to find out what's really going on other than your word. And if your word misleads us or guides us in the wrong direction because some of the words fell into corruption, then God, to whom shall we go? Because you and you alone have the words of eternal life. Father, bless this book. Open up our hearts to it, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.